Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We're still a little bit shook from Thursday's game, it would be fair to say. The referees call the incredible match. Then the Shield went on the weekend as well. It's been a huge few days of rugby. And we've got a special guest to help us break it down over the next hour or so. In studio, James Parsons as ever. Bryn Hall over in Japan. And special guest this week, Wallabies legend. 110 tests for the Wallabies. Will Genia, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. No problem at all. Now, tell us, well, what are you up to right now? You're in Brizzy, but you're heading back to Japan soon? Yeah, in Brizzy. I've been off since May, since the end of our season. Uh, and we, I head back in a couple of weeks to, to start up pre-season with, with my club, Kintetsu. And, yeah, we've been just promoted to, to top league now. So looking forward to that challenge. You obviously watched that game on Thursday. Exciting contest. The big talking point on both sides of the Tasman is what happened at the end there. That referee's call on the delay of play and Foley not kicking the ball out. From your perspective, was it the right call? I don't think it was the right call, but but I I I, I, I can see both sides. Like I I, I get uh, what the referee was saying in regards to, you know, he gave him numerous warnings, and if you actually listen to the audio, I think he does a pretty good job to be clear. You player, I switch on the time and you play immediately. Okay. And you wait, you wait, you wait. So that's a strength for the All Blacks. I think part of that responsibility goes to, to Bernard in terms of being more aware. But I just think that you've ne- we've never seen that rule implemented before. You know, we've, we've never seen it. Like, once that outlet takes forever to kick the ball out and walks the lineouts, we've never seen it with Northern Hemispheres. Northern Hemisphere teams tend to take a long time in that similar process. And I... I, I if that's the case, if that's what it's going to be, then they have to do it every single time. Or, and more specifically, that particular ref has to be able to do. He has to do that every single time because it just doesn't. It doesn't. It's not a good look if if it's just a one-off thing like that. If, if that makes sense. Look, I think it was pretty courageous to make that call. Like so often we see in the last moments of test matches and especially big games, they almost are too scared to rule anything. Like I even think the penalty. Like that was a that was a big penalty that Fukiti got um, for Dane Coles holding on, and he just blew it straight away. You know, sometimes you see they get a little bit of an extra cleaner and they let it go because they want it to play out. And then it was Fukiti's reaction behind that made me think, man, he must have been told so many times. Um, and and I think it's also um, it's where you can you know we we have better physical athletes on the field, but sometimes you know knowing the laws and being a student in the game, and I think TJ Perinara is one that does it really well. He challenges the ref with facts, and, and that's a point of difference at that level. And, and had they known that that was the consequence of a scrum, because you heard Dave Rennie say, well, he didn't know it was going to be a scrum, but it's not really the ref's responsibility to point that out. He made it clear, you've got to, you've got to play, you've got to kick it, and he didn't. And as he said to Nick White with the audio, is, you, you know, you, if you think I'm not going to rule a penalty, at the end of the game, you, now you know. And, and I think, I do agree with you, Will, though, he has to be consistent moving forward now because it, it can't be a one-off. Because, but also, I do think players' behaviours will change when he's reffing now. I think they'll, they, will, they will move a lot faster. And, and, and I think he'll be consistent in his process of giving a warning, and then you'll know because everyone knows now. I really agree. I think it was, def- it was a really courageous decision to, to make, certainly. And I think if you couple that with the fact that he gave a lot of warning. There was, there was actually very clear communication around, I'm going to turn the time back on now. I want you to play. We're not wasting time here. And I heard Dave Rennie say that he, the referee didn't have a feel for the occasion or for the game. But I actually think the opposite. I think the fact that he was courageous enough to make that decision, probably, I think he has, it's almost like he, he has a better feel for the game because he understands what Australia's trying to do. He understands that we're trying to slow the game down and, and win it by, by wasting time. So it's like, well, I'm not going to let you do that. And so I, I, I definitely agree that it was a courageous decision. I think, and I, I'm all for giving referees discretion. I, I, I think that too often the TMO is involved for one. So we've got to be able to back the referees to actually referee the game. And you've got to give them that discretion to be able to make rulings. Uh, the, but it just comes back on them to now be consistent um, each time they obviously go out and they do their job and perform. That's a good point. The first half, it went for 58 minutes. 58 minutes the first half. That's a long first half. Um, Bryn, what's your thoughts? I'd rather the ref not have an influence on the game to, to be able to be the headlines of the newspaper to give his decision. So for me, I actually thought the Australians were hard done by I do know why Bernard Foley was doing it. He's trying to milk time and probably bluffed and got the bluff wrong, unfortunately. But for me, I just think um, 
having the game finished like that, where the Aussies had done so hard to make, to make a really good comeback, considering you know, they were down a couple of tries, um, I thought they were really unlucky. And the All Blacks probably got away with one, scoring one to win it with Geordie Barrett in the final minutes. I don't think he should be shot for doing his job, though. Like, he's there to perform a role just like players are, and if he lets it go and he feels uncomfortable about it, then he's not fulfilling what he's there to do. Personally, like, I, as I say, like, I'm more frustrated when things aren't called. No one thinks about time wasting in minute one. That's the hard part when we talk about consistency, right? We always want consistent calls, but if you're not thinking about something, it's not going to be consistent. And, and the reason I bring that up is that Law 9.7 says a player must not waste time. That is all it says. It doesn't say how long time wasting is. So unless you say that and have that written in the rules, how is a ref supposed to make that consistent throughout a game? They've just got to write into the rules. You've got 30 seconds to kick this ball to touch. That's it. Otherwise, free kick. Like I, the more I think about it now, like it's, you actually look at how he did it. He actually gave pretty clear communication. He turned time off, told him, turned time back on and say, we're not here to waste time. So, uh, yeah, I tend to agree that, yeah, you can't shoot him for doing his job. Whether, like, I wouldn't have made that decision in that particular instant. And being an Aussie, like, I wish he didn't. Don't get me wrong. We could be playing for the Birders like for the first time in 20 odd years this weekend. But, um, yeah, I, I, I almost feel even more positive towards the fact that he made the decision now that we we're having this conversation. We're just working this through. Yeah. This is like a counselling session. Yeah. Therapy. This is therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Brenner's still blowing up. <laughs> I just think, I just think like, it's a penalty and it's, a, a, and it's an infringement and that kind of, because you tend to probably think that the calls aren't getting caught in penalties when it's holding on or off his feet that's been refereed through the whole game and they get scared to put the whistle in their pocket for the last couple of minutes or five minutes. But for me, for a decision where it wasn't really a penalty, it was just more so um, an out of the you know out of the blue kind of penalty that hasn't been done before. Scrum, sorry. I just think Australia were really hard done by. I tell you what, guys. You know, the, the, just from another perspective, as someone who's played against the All Blacks for a long period of time, the moment that they got that scrum, I my heart sank. Yeah. I just thought, here <laughs> yep. we go. Here we go. I I, I just had this feeling something's going to happen where they're going to score, and it just eventuated that way. And do you think? That's how the Aussie team felt, though, a little bit, because they were so frustrated by it. It's almost like they knew they were going to score from that position mm -hmm. rather than sort of just switching and, right, we need to nail the scrum, we've got a defensive set. Do you know that the emotion and the heightened emotion probably didn't help them execute in that last minute to stop a try happening? I mean, the best way to answer that is if I think about, like, all black teams that I've played against and I look at this particular team, which, you know, is, is, is very similar to all those other teams, like, they seem to be so very process driven so that no moment is too big or too small for them. And so as opposition, whenever you're facing them, you always know that regardless of what's happening, they're going to be able to perform their roles. And so maybe it's, it's, it was that and, and then the emotion, you know, getting too caught up in, in what had just happened and not being switched on to what they were supposed to do. Um, Cause it, 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 it's, it's one of those things where you could see when we got the penalty, it was almost like we've won the game. And then yeah. to go from that to then having a five meter scrum, you know, that's obviously going to play with your mindset a little bit as well. Mm. But yeah, for me, my heart sank because, like, I, to me, I know that I don't think there's any other team in the world of sport that's so, so good at being so process focused that you almost just trust that they're going to be they're going to score or get be able to, to to get points somehow. One of the things that's been lost in all of this is how big a play that was from Will Jordan to cut back in, straighten up, basically oh. take on four blokes and then back himself to throw the offload. Like, it was a huge play from Will Jordan. Massive in the sense that he could have got away from his support as well. And had he been, you know, chopped down, he would have been isolated and it could have been a turnover at that point. And, and then the offload, and it was, it was, it was, you know, we so often seen him score and he scored a beauty that night, but... His ability to you know, hold his feet and, and have that strength to give the offload was huge. A lot of the times in test rugby, you're always looking for the perfect picture. You're looking for an overlap. You're never going to get it. The best a lot of the times you get is man-on-man -man matchups. And you see that they were calling for the ball, wanting the ball in their hands to be able to try and make a play. And I just love that mindset. Mm -hmm. They back themselves to, 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 to beat, beat, beat us one-on-one -on -one and create that opportunity. And he's, he's a special player, isn't he, Will Jordan? I tell you, I love watching him play. Now, before we move on, I just want to jump back to this delay play call because I feel like there's some good yarns in here. That surely you've been in a game where someone's done something particularly dumb trying to delay the play or done something just outrageously clever. No, the, the worst one that I've been involved in is, you know, you have that call that sometimes, you know, you, if you've been on a long period of defence, you know you can't sort of move on without 
you know, a front rower. And there's normally a call to, you know, give the team a breather. And on this occasion, I won't say which team or which player, but um, <laughs> they were, they, oh, it would be embarrassing. <laughs> um, they were told to, to obviously take a knee, <laughs> but they were so confused or such, I didn't know where to grab um, to, to sort of pretend where they'd been injured. Anyway, so they grabbed like their neck like that. And in the end, the match doctor pulled them off for an HIA. <laughs> And then oh. he failed the HIA <laughs> and couldn't come back on. It was about 10 minutes into the game, the mate. Oh, my God. It was like <laughs> That's the actually, uh, comical. I've actually got one with them. Um, I actually won't. Um, oh. I'll, I'll name and shame him. I'll name and shame him. It was actually Sibu Reese. We were playing um, We were playing a game, and he was obviously trying to milk milk a penalty. And um, and then he had to go off the field to do, to do an HIA, but they had already ruled him out because he was obviously down on the ground for so long. He didn't even get to do the testing, so he, he obviously tried to milk the penalty. <laughs> got sent off, wasn't allowed to come back on, had a hot dog at half time, and was in the stands with the boys for the rest of the last 40. Oh, go. <laughs> I tell you, I don't, I don't have any stories like that, but uh, talking about like wanting to delay the game, I've had that many times where I've been that buggered in test matches and in Super Rugby games where I've just told like, my hook was on my front roll yeah. to go down it because I need a rest. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I can think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but let's go back to that game because it was an incredible game. Uh, where would you say most entertaining Bledisloe you've seen since when? How I mean, maybe 2000, the classic. Yeah, I honestly think it's the most entertaining game I've seen. Like 2000 obviously is the classic. That's the benchmark. But you know, I was 12 years old then. So yeah, I would say since then it's absolutely the most – because – 31-13 down, the All Blacks have played some really good rugby, rugby up until that point. And then for us to, to, to not only stay in the fight, but go up levels and actually play some really, really good rugby, some really good running, attacking football, uh, it, it was just such a great contest. And even with all the controversy around the refereeing decision and things like that, just the way it finished. As a spectator, as someone who was watching the game, like I, I my heart was like coming through my chest. Mm. It, it was just such a, an amazing and thrilling battle and such great entertainment. My wife wasn't watching the game. She was in bed and I was screaming at the television. She started texting me every time I screamed at the television, like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you doing in bed? Yeah, come out. <laughs> You're missing out on all of this. Um, what about for you? Yeah, I was the same. Like, I couldn't even sleep afterwards, like, because it was so, it was th I was so hyped from what was happening and sort of in disbelief that the adrenaline is pumping so much that, um, yeah, you know, you just, I couldn't settle down, so it took me to about two o'clock to, to to cool cool the jets and um, mm. get to sleep. It was just, I, I agree, it's the best test match, best game of rugby I've watched in a long time. And I know we mentioned the 58 minutes, but it didn't feel like 58 minutes that first half to me. Like it, there was just so much going on. There was yellow cards, there was TMOs, there was you know quality um, footy being played. It was. I don't know, from, from woe to go, it was a special test match. Mm. To be honest, when it was 30, 31 13, when Will Jordan scores that try, I thought the game was really done and dusted. I thought um, the All Blacks would go, would power on off that. But to their credit, you know, they played some really great attacking um, rugby, the Australians. You know, Brendan Brenner Foley taking it to the line to be able to set Callaway up for his first try. And then obviously Pete Samu, man, what a performance that he had. Um, I'd be interested to see, Will, what he thinks the number seven jersey should look like moving forward, because I thought. Pete Samu was one of the best on the on the paddock on the weekend, and so um, just you'd have to feel gutted for the Australians because um, you know they did so well to get back into that game, and obviously with some yellow cards. And um, you know, I thought I thought actually who was the one that got was it Swain, the one that he did on um, Quinta Pio. He was lucky not to get a red card. I thought with that um, with what he did, but um, yeah, just to be able to win, to try and win that Test match with one minute to go and working hard back from that 31-13. Um, you know, it was a great uh, display of. I guess hearts and a bit of uh, bit of care in that Australian jersey because if you had to come back 31 13 against probably the All Blacks, uh, you'd probably say in the past, past Blues like campaigns, they would have just run away with that game, but uh, they didn't in the end. You like Samu at seven, Will? I, I do actually, yeah. I think his point of difference is he's a bigger body mm -hmm. than, than a Fraser McRide or a Michael Hooper. I mean, Michael Hooper is obviously world class um, and he's the leader of that side, obviously dealing with a few things uh, in his personal life. But I, I thought some, Pete Samu is just so athletic. And he's a big body, and he's he's got the the X factor, the ability to stand in contact and offload. He's really strong over the ball. He's got a he's got a big engine and a big work rate. So I thought he was excellent. I thought his performance was excellent. The thing that I wanted to ask you guys, which I thought was interesting, was we didn't see any box kicking off nine from the All Blacks. A lot of the kicking was off ten, either contestable kicking off ten or long kicking, which I thought was quite a, quite a different tactical change. 
Yeah, I think we see it a lot in Super Rugby. Probably the Crusaders box kick the most, and Bryn would know that more, but that suits their sort of conditions at home. But, uh, you know, a lot of the super sides do contestable kicks off 10, um, and, and players mm -hmm. like Caleb Clark love that. They love being in the contest. They love that as an option. And, and I think one person that kicks a hell of a lot for the Crusaders is David Harvilli. I know he was off early, but, you know, he does have that ability. We spoke about it last week. Just those attacking kicks to give guys like Caleb an opportunity there with um, and, and just manipulating that backfield to create space for maybe a 50-22 because a couple of those short ones, wingers and fullbacks start encroaching and then that's when you can pull trigger and go the long one for the 50-22 as well. So it's all about that sort of like chess game with their kick strategy that I think they've found works for them better than the box kick and they, they probably went to the box kick to kick long and out when they were under pressure from, from, from where I saw it. Also I know as a 10, if you kick it to the far side with the winger, it's only it's, it's a lot easier to be able to get up for the ball and you're only beating one man instead of beating three or four that are escorting that kind of box kick. And then I think we've seen a bit of a change in um, the long kicking game with obviously two in the backfield now with 10 and 15 usually roaming there. We've seen the attacking kicks from Davey Ritchie early on. Um, they continued that with the crossfield kicks as well from Geordie Barrett. But I think going down the middle of the field now seems to be a ploy from, from most international teams. And even in Super Rugby, the Crusaders were there being able to kick on the run with a good go-for ball and getting into that 22 metre zone. Ideally, you'd love to let it bounce a couple of times if it does go in the middle of the field. But even so, if you do get that kick deep and uh, then they kick it out, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a net gain of being able to get a line out on the 40 or the 50. And so I think, you know, I'd like to see that the All Blacks will probably continue to keep going long sticks down the middle of the field and continue to keep doing the attacking kicks, whether it be off Richie, Geordie showed um, players be able to do that. And then also David Harvilli with his attacking kicks as well. It appears to be the key change that's worked for them this year when the attack wasn't working against Ireland, when it wasn't working against South Africa. That has been the major switch. Yeah, and I think we've seen when they've had success, their kicks in play are, you know, 20 plus, 25 plus. I think, I think it also, what it does is it keeps the defence guessing because if you, mm. if, when you're setting up to kick off nine, it's so obvious. Mm. And teams start to drop mm. back into the backfield, they understand that they can escort kickers and things like that. Whereas I thought on the weekend, them playing to 10 and either kicking off 10 or playing that extra pass, playing off 12 or even kicking out wide, it keeps the defence guessing and it allows you to manipulate the backfield a little bit better. If you can get a couple of passes out wide, you bring the winger up, the fullback comes across and, and you can kick long and find grass. And I thought it's something they did really well. And I, I was expecting to see a lot of the box kicking and so I can imagine that it, it probably was something that the Wallabies would have had to have adjust to along, along as the game went along as well. So I thought it was a pretty, pretty smart tactic. Yeah, I think it's a great way to be able to build pressure because I think, you know, we saw against the Ireland series, when you're, if you're not winning that breakdown and you're not being able to play on the front foot, your kicking game, it's really hard to be able to gain ascendancy and trying to put teams under pressure. So South Africa do it a lot differently. Obviously, they kick a lot off nine and they get a good a lot of pay being able to get up for the ball, great contestables off Hendrick Sow or even Fafta Clerk in the past. But what I do like with the All Blacks, when Davey was there, you've got Richie, Aaron, and then you've got Rich, um, Richie, Aaron, and Davey who can kick, and you've also got Geordie as a kicking option. So defensively, you've got to be on the whole time because all players in the back line can be able to manipulate and kick spaces if you're not on the job. And just on that last, even that 50-22, you know, it's made it really, really good off a turnover. You know, if you get that click attack, usually you go two pass to be able to want to try and attack. But with that 50-22, if you get a turnover in your 50 metre zone, you can kick it left foot or right foot, which David Harvilli's done quite a few times. So I really have enjoyed that 50-22 aspect because um, the backfield, is had to move a lot more. If you don't get it right, you can be back in your haunches in the back in the 22 metre zone. And, you know, if you're a South African team and you get a 50-22, you know, they're going to their line out more, rolling more, and then going to be score points off that. So you consider those tactics and you look at, you mentioned this week, what happens at 12 for the All Blacks. Does that mean that Geordie Barrett is a, a sure thing at 12 this week and not Roger Tuivasa-Shep? You'd have to think so, man. That was some game. I don't know what you boys thought, but I thought that was one of Geordie's mm. best tests. Like... He was exceptional, um, you know, creating space. And I thought Rico alongside him, they worked really well together. They created, you know, if you use Richie Wonga's try, very similar to um, Davey Havili and Lester Whanganuku. They run that play at the Crusaders and give it out the back to Richie. And um, Rico ran a really nice line. Geordie obviously gave it out the back. But the most impressive thing for me is I don't think he would have prepared to run at 12 all week. And, and you, no. heard, you heard the chat at half time was like, oh, there's a couple of guys not in familiar roles, but you, <laughs> you wouldn't have known. Like, the guy was um, flawless. It was genuinely the circumstance and the occasion and thrown into something he um, wasn't expecting to perform the way he performed. It was like he thrived on it. It's, and he's just a big, like a big body. And he, he, he just got us gain line and he has that finesse as well and, and got the match winner. I, I thought he was exceptional and, and you'd have to 
back him for 12. And I know Fozzie's come out publicly before and said he doesn't see him as a 12, but that's a big statement at international level that he's, he is a genuine option. He'll probably change that now with there being four injuries in the, in the <laughs> midfielders. I think yeah, it's kind of forced his hand to be able to think of Geordie as a number 12 option, or you bring someone else like Nankerville or somebody like Umanga Jensen that's been there in the past. But what I like about Geordie, and I think the Olympics have had so much success, is with that, with the number 12 being able to have, be a triple threat, whether that be running, kicking, and passing. So Geordie has all those attributes and is really good to be able to play 12 because he, he can be able to do that. And so, but at the same time, you know, you've selected Roger Tuivasa-Shek at the start of the year, and you'd probably have to think now, if there's ever a time for him to be able to see if he's going to be up for it, it'd have to be coming up into this this next Wallabies Test match because you know he's played NPC, he's been able to get a get a couple of games. But I think um, if they're not going to go with Geordie, then I think you know Rog, it's probably the only time they're really going to see it with these injuries out at the moment. So it'd be interesting to see how how they go. Does Rog have that extra little bit with the kicking as well? There will that affect their game plan if they are missing a twelve who doesn't have that capability to test level, or at least we don't know if he does. To be honest, we didn't see it much at the Blues. We didn't see him kick a lot um, at the Blues have been able to do that. He's a great attacking weapon, and that's probably one thing that he has, and it's his strength. He's been able to attack with the ball, and he can have that distribution be able to put players away. But I just think with the international game is at the moment, you've got to have a 12 that can be able to kick the field and take your pressure off your inside backs. You know, if you get that ball from Aaron and, and um, Richie gives that second pass to that second pivot, um, David Harvilli is so good at being able to use that kick space and take pressure off um, the All Blacks pack and even the, the, the backs as well. So um, whether he's been able to work on that and can do that at Tesla at match level, I just think he needs to get to, it gets to, gets to a point now where we need to see Rog playing if they do see him as, a, as an option coming to that Rugby World Cup next year. From the outside looking in, Will, where do you see the All Blacks 12 jersey sitting come the World Cup? Uh, I mean, in the immediate, obviously, I think Geordie Barrett, I'd like to see him at 12. I thought, I, I thought he was excellent. Uh, you know, I think going back to what Bryn was saying there, the triple threat, the, the ability to pass, run, and kick and it just gives you it just opens the field up for you being able to do that whether that be the cross field mm. kicks off the extra pass or you again you get that extra pass off from nine to ten to twelve just that extra pass knowing that he can kick that manipulates the backfield in itself and that opens up even more of the field so uh, i would probably in the immediate look to look to play him and i also do like the the, the dynamic of bowden at fullback i thought bowden coming on a fullback at half time i thought he was excellent and he's he, we all know he's he's a truly world-class player so but I think moving forward, I'd, I would like to see Roger get given an opportunity because he is an incredible athlete. Um, and we've seen glimpses of how good he can be. And maybe it's a case of, look, the Bledisloe's locked away for another another year. He, maybe he's, he starts or he comes off the bench and they give him a good chunk of minutes in, in the second half, depending mm-hmm. on how the game's going, just to be able to get a feel of what he can do in, in big games and in big moments. Yeah, I definitely think he'll come off the bench. Um, and, and I think that would be the, the safer play is to give him decent minutes, maybe a whole half, whatever it may be. But I, I do think it's key that we start the test with someone that can kick and is 100% sure that they can nail those attacking kicks. Because what that does is it slows the line speed. It makes, you know, sort of those the midfield of the Wallabies think. And if they know that there's no kick there or there's a perception that there's no kick there, they are going to be rushing and getting up and they'll have that confidence that that space might not be a threat. So that that would stop the, the front foot ball that we've been seeing. And then by slowing that line speed with the attacking kicking game early, it's it's provided space for guys like Rico, Caleb Clark, and you've seen the best of these uh, you know attacking weapons. I mean, we've spoken about Rico in terms of how his speed saves us on defence. He did it again on the weekend when um, Caleb flew out of the line and he gets back and and holds up Callaway. But, man, when he's got time and space, there's not many he can't either run round or through. Um, He is in um, rear touch, but a lot to do with this attacking, kicking game, providing him the space and time to do so. Mm. So if you do start Geordie at 12, do you start Bowden at fullback or do you finally give Will Jordan the crack that a lot of people have been asking for in the 15 jersey? Potentially, yeah. I haven't. I actually didn't even think. Wait. I thought you'd just naturally go Bowden at 15. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an option. I, I think that it's still at Eden Park. They won't want to have that record broken. Um, and I just think Bodie is still a very, very well cast player. And it's just, OK, if Jordan goes to 15, who, who gets to the wing? Or can you have both those guys? And and to be fair to Will, Will's just found his mojo again. You know, do we want to move him a position to go, OK, yeah, find it again? You know, he's just got back in his rhythm. I think leave him where he is and, and get Bowden out there. And, um, yeah, you saw 
he connected with Will pretty well on, on that chip kick. It takes more pressure off Richie. It's, it's just a good feel, a good balance. Do you make as few changes as you possibly have to, Bryn? Yeah, I think so. Obviously, injury in the midfield is probably going to be a little bit different in who they're going to select there. But I think, you know, if they're going to have Roger at 12, for, for an example, then having Bodie at the back, you know, and even Will on the on the, on the on the wing as well, it gives them being able to have those kicking options where they can get into those positions of a second pivot and can be able to use the, their kicking game if Roger's going to be selected at 12. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't imagine there'd be a lot of changes just due to injury. They might have a, a few tweaks here and there, but um, I guess the... The question is, is who's going to be the 12? Because, you know, they said in the past that Geordie isn't going to be there. He hasn't, Fozzie hasn't seen him there. But I think with the injuries that the All Blacks have had, I think it'll either be him um, or Rog starting their, their test match. And hopefully, yeah, there could be Bowden Barrett at fullback as well. But for me, I'd like to see Will at fullback. I know um, he can attack a lot more, but I would be in that 15 role. Um, but again, he's just found his mojo on the wing, and you can have Bowden Barrett for another kicking option. Who, and who is the world pass player as well? What about the Wallabies? Do you see major changes there, Will? Well, I think there'll be a few in force through through injury. I mean, Slips, James Slip has obviously done his calf. Probably Otis done an Achilles. Um, so I'd imagine someone like a Scott Sio might will come in as a like as a replacement for Slips. Uh, and but the interesting thing is, is, yeah, for me is the back row. I mean, Rob Liotta obviously started the test, and maybe Jed Holloway slips back into into number six, and and we bring in depending on if Darcy Swain gets suspended, he comes into the, into the second row. So. There'll be some enforced changes, but I, I, I dare say they'll look to, to keep the core of the group together because, again, it was a pretty good performance. The only thing I'd probably think that they, whether they want to change it, I thought Nick White coming off the bench, I thought he was excellent. I thought Jake mm. Gordon was very good in the first half, but I thought when Nick White came on, I thought there was a bit of a spark there to the attack in terms of, he just seems to have a really good understanding of how they want to play and he seems to make good decisions based on the pitches that he's seeing in terms of when to kick, when to pass, when to run, the direction of the attack. Um, so it'll be an interesting one to see. Uh, I know Dave's real big on picking guys that perform not only in game but perform in training. So we'll just have to wait and see. Do you think that was a direct tactic, having White off the bench to to bring the team home? Like you know, start well, keep close, and then giving a guy like him that fresh legs against tiring forwards. I, I just wonder if that was a direct tactic, and that's what they were looking to do. I'm not too sure if it was a direct tactic. I know that Dave said that um, throughout in the build-up to the test that he wasn't happy with Whitey's performance against the, against the Springboks. Um, so maybe he, he's paid the price. He obviously paid the price for, the, for, for his performance. But it's funny. We like Starting with Whitey, we expect the younger guys to come on like a Jake Gordon or a Tate McDermott to add that spark. And we actually haven't seen that. Mm. I don't think that they've, they've, been, they've fulfilled that role as much as we thought they would have. And then it's, you flip the script and the older sort of experienced player who's been starting the entire time probably bring, makes the most difference coming off the bench. So maybe maybe it's a tactic to consider moving forward because when you come on at the end of the game and you either need to speed it up or score points or it's a tight game, that experience really counts. And, and we've seen now with international rugby that particularly in positions like halfback and hooker, it's never the 70-10 or 60-20 as far as the minutes. It's always like it's a lot of the times now it's 50-55 minutes mm. for the starter and then you know, the rest for the for the guy coming on. And so it's one of those things where what works best based on the type of players that you have. And maybe that's Whitey's role. I don't know. I don't know. He did exceptionally well, I thought, coming off the bench. Could be Taweta Kubalo's role. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. <laughs> Give us your thoughts. I don't know how that makes you guys feel. It was, it, was pretty, it, was, it was pretty weird seeing that, I'll tell you. He's won a World Cup yeah. in the All Blacks. He's a great player. Um, yeah. And then to just come out and say that as if it's so off the cuff, like... I thought that was really strange. <laughs> what's, your thought, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that, though, Will? If he was actually, you know, he's made himself eligible, how would you feel about him um, putting on the Wallabies jersey? How would that go in the squad and even in Australia and your country? Uh, it, uh, looking from the outside in, it would be pretty strange. I'm not going to lie, because I, I, like, I played against him. Um, and he, he, was a, he was a very good All Black. He's won a World Cup as an All Black. Uh, he was a very... He's an exceptional player, and he still is an exceptional player. So it's, it's, I don't know. It's, but you, you can't sort of then judge him and not, and not have that same sort of um, perspective on guys who do it, who have played for the All Blacks, and then go play for Tonga or whoever else. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it's the rules, mm -hmm. and and you can obviously you're doing things within the rules. I, to me, it'd be a strange one, but I, I did like that Dave came out and said that you know halfbacks probably the, the the area that we've got the most depth in, so we're going to trust the guys that we have. 
Outside of them, Bernard Foley, Quade Cooper, obviously Dave Rennie's, you know, put a lot of faith in the guys with a lot of experience. What do you make of the progression of Noah Lollaseal? Because he seems to have a lot of talent, but he, he he's not being backed for significant periods of time in the jersey, is he? No, and I think that's something that can obviously do, play a lot with a player, a young a young person's confidence. Um, you know, when you get pick, drop, pick, drop. But to be fair, like the fact that they've been picking him and giving him those opportunities, it's on him to take it. And I was having a conversation with someone about this the other day. As a young, inexperienced playmaker in those high-pressure environments, when th- you, you, you tend to always be looking for the perfect picture. You, you're, as a, you're counting numbers, you're looking from outside in, you're looking at the backfield, you want to see where the obvious space is. And then you, you make your decisions based on that. His big thing is he's got to realise that at that level, you're never going to get perfect and obvious pictures. It's like I touched on earlier when you always the best that you're probably going to get is is, is man on man matchups, and you've got to be then brave enough to be able to call that. Whereas I think with him, he's he's sitting back and looking for perfect pictures, and then he's not getting them, and he's not being confident enough to call the ball at the back of those forward pods and and, and make the play. And then also, I think off the back of that, when things aren't going his way, he's standing deeper and deeper and deeper, and it makes it a little bit easier for him to defend. And you know, I I, I compare him with someone like Quaid. Like when Quaid was young he was someone who always took the game on and whether he was making bad decisions or not, he was making bad decisions quickly. And you can always do something with that because there's intent behind it. And so for him, his progression, I would like to see him just really go out there and just back himself and get his hands on the ball as much as he can and just make decisions, be decisive and, and take the game on. Because I think it, it, there's going to come a point where you can only give, give them, give him so, so many opportunities uh, for him to be able to take him. And, and he's got guys like Quaid and Bernard who have obviously been there and shown him, and it's on him now. The onus is on him to be able to learn from what he's seen from those guys. Mm. I think looking just on, on that, just on that, Will. Just, just on that, because as a team, you know, as an inside pairing, it's really important to be able to have that communication outside you, whether it be the outsides or the midfielder, giving that information into you. So for Lollisier to be able to play up and see what's in front of him, because, you know, I look at Richie, but this time, he's got a great communicator and Davey and Jack and even Will and Sibby have given the pitches and been able to see what he can see in front of him. And so he can just play instinctively, which is probably saying that Noah's not getting. So do you think they lack that in their midfield combination at the moment, even though they're either a little bit young, Fakiti came on and, and played well, but do they have that kind of um, game management within the midfielding ranks at the moment? Probably not. You'd say probably not. Obviously, Hunter being injured, not playing, he, he brings a lot of voice and a lot of communication because he's got experience. And then Samu is obviously a big one not being there. He, he's mm. someone who would just give a lot of confidence. Um, mm. So that might have offset the fact that, you know, Quaid being injured, having Noah there and still having Samu there, that that, that makes it, that would have made a big difference. But um, it, it's one of those things that we are inexperienced from, from that 10, 12, 13 channel. You've then got to be able to, to understand, all right, well, if I'm not going to have that voice there, I'm either going to continue to um, keep demanding it and, and being assertive with those guys to give me that communication. But if not, you've got to then take the game on yourself. Um, and I think you saw that with someone like Bernard. Like, the, it almost seemed, seemed like nothing was on for that Kellaway try when he took the, took the, when he carried the ball to the line and he gets that offload away. You know, maybe an inexperienced tenor, whether it's Noah or someone else, probably sits back and waits for the forwards to get around the corner. But Bernard calls the ball and, and takes the ball to the line and tries to create something from that. Um, and so, yeah, like the experience on the outside helps, but if you don't have it, it's one of those things where, you, well, I've got to take the game on here myself. I think as well, like looking on the other side, you know, for the All Blacks, it's, it's really looks like, and Bryn, you can probably um, comment on this the best, but it really looks like Richie Moanga is bossing this team now. I don't know, like he was in the huddle, he's really owning it. He's He is backing his skill set. It's not always a perfect picture, but he's just, he is just fully committed. And, you know, we've had this 10 battle discussion, but it, it's it's almost like he looks like the Richie Moanga we've seen in the Crusaders jersey at international level. And just like Will was saying, you're never going to get that perfect picture. And it's almost like he's come to terms with that and he goes, well, I'm just going to make it. Mm. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to find a way to bend this defence. And a lot of it has come off the back of the changing of the kick strategy. But I don't know, he's just oozing confidence. And, and it's probably been overlooked because the forwards are getting a lot of praise for providing the flat uh, you know, front foot ball. But I, I do think he just looks so settled. Um, and I don't want to jinx him or anything, but he looks like the Crusader Richie. Yeah. I just think you can't underestimate how good, like, how good Davey is when it comes to his communication skills. He's 
he's such a great communicator. And so when you've got a 10 that can be able to um, trust a guy that's given the right uh, amount, of, amount of information into you at a quick rate, you can make decisions based on knowing that trust that you have. And I think Davies' kicking game is just, it opens up the backfield and opens up opportunities for, for their All Blacks team. And I think you know, probably in the past, we didn't have that kind of triple threat 12 who was able to uh, manipulate whether it be run, pass, kick. But, uh, you know, you see in the last test match, you know, Davies' um, ability to be able to put little chips in. He can kick off both feet. He can do cross-field kicks. He can do contestables as well. And so you're always, when you're with Davy, is he going to kick? Is he going to run? And so it kind of, I guess, that defensive pressure that you see with the line speed, um, it gets halted. It gets stopped just a little bit because of that um, decision-making around what is Davy going to do? And so, but I think the communication side and what he gives, and I think, you know, with Rico as well, them being able to form that partnership and play together and get cohesion, I think it's making Richie being able to perform and we were seeing with the Crusaders, whether he'd be running, um, influencing games where he probably hasn't done that in the last couple of years in the All Blacks, but he's actually taking, having moments in game and where he's been able to influence and, um, you know, win test matches due to his form and what he's doing in the game. The South Africans look like a completely different team with Damien Willems are there, Bryn. Like, it's just the attack yeah. is just light years away from what it is otherwise. Yeah, it is. He's a, he's just a great, uh, he's got great footwork and he's actually a big man for number 10 as well. And it'll be interest, interesting to see, if, you know, if they want to go back to that Pollard style because, you know, one of their biggest strengths is obviously their kicking game and Pollard and, and Victor Kluke and even Hendricks as well. You know, they can put their contestables up to Kate teams. But for me, I love seeing Villains to play. He takes the line. He's a great ball carrier. He's got, he can do both way. He's got a great distribution game with 10 and being at 15 and players away with his, with his distribution game. But, I guess for me, are they going to be brave enough to be able to have Vilimsa in that kind of style or are they going to stick to their stock standard that they've had from the World Cup previously in the contestable games? Because I think I like seeing when Vilimsa is at 10, but whether they're going to be able to do that move forward, I don't think they might, they might not go there and I'll go back to Pollard. I think they have to. The, the points differential, I think New Zealand are ahead at 13, so they're going to have to score points mm -hmm. whether they, you know, for this game in particular coming up, they'll know the mm -hmm. outcome of the All Blacks um, Aussies, so they'll know exactly what they've got to do. And I think it's key if the All Blacks do win at Eden Park and they get a bonus point to peel in that 13, um, they are going to need a playmaker that is prepared to play and prepared to score points this week in particular. But I think they may go between the two um, moving forward for the different styles of players that they have in Pollard and Willemsa. But if they want to win the rugby championship, he must be at 10 this week. Mm. Um, it just feels like a nice natural evolution for them. We know they've got the backs, Will, outside. We know they've got the backs to win this, these games in style, but they don't use them. Willems seems like a guy who can make that work. 100%. I, I love him at 10. Naturally, he's, his instincts are to be able to attack. He wants to attack. He wants to run the ball, but then he obviously fits in quite nicely with the, the style that they like to play. Obviously, we know that they're a high-pressure team in terms of defensive line speed, the contestable kicks off 9, off 10. Uh, and playing off, off scrappy ball in that sense. But then if you add a little bit of polish, which I think he brings in, in wanting to use the ball and attack, they've got such great attacking weapons. Mm. Like you, you've got Mapimpi mm. on one wing, you've got Dialende, uh, Lukanyo and when he comes back. Like to be able to open up the game and open up the field and get those in, guys involved a little bit more with ball in hand, man, they, they can be one hell of a team like moving forward. And I think he's almost transformed them into that type of team. And if he can continue to obviously perform and play well, um, I think he, he can ha have a big hand in helping them grow as a team from just being that one-dimensional sort of, um, you know, kicking team. Hmm. And, and yeah. Bryn, does Hendricks fit better with that philosophy than maybe having Faf at nine, where it could go back the other way? Yes and no. I think Hendricks has played played well, you know, considering that obviously he's a little bit more attacking game and scored that nice try on the weekend and actually can get around the, when the, boys are, uh, when the South African boys are getting around the corner. In the 22, he's been able to get out and have a little play. But Fuff can actually do that as well. I've seen him a lot of times being able to play that high tempo. You know, it wasn't too long ago before that World Cup, they were wanting to play with ball in hand, and Fuff was able to get to the ball really, really fast. But I think, um, you know, at the moment where they are, I think the contestable and the high pressure that they can put on other teams is where they go. And I think when they do start to open up a little bit more is when they go into their line out more, 25 metres, 22 metres out from the goal line, and then also um, playing the same way off. It's a bit than the big boys getting around the corner, but um, yeah, I've enjoyed Hendricks. Though. I think you know, Fuff, uh, you know what you're going to get with him. And I guess the good thing about inexperienced players is when they are playing well, you keep them in, then you keep them um, when a rich trainer form and keep, keep, keep letting them play because you know what, what Fuff's going to give you. You know, he's, he's an experienced campaigner, and so you play with a hot hand, and it is at the moment. And Hendricks seems to be doing that a little bit more than Fuff at the moment. Mm. Well, one of the areas in the game which 
probably you know changed the way the game ran was in that first half, right towards the end. Argentina had some shots at scoring some points, and they stuffed up two lineouts. Mm. What is the way to approach it as a hooker, as a, as a forward pack, when you've got a pressure lineout like that, where you know it's going to change the momentum of the game? What's the process to do that right? Well, I think you've got to back your prep and, and what you've done during the week, and you'll have a clear plan, a lineout plan as to what you can go to. But all teams will have a safety throw, or a, and if, the, if it is a high pressure a moment it may be to go to that call, but so often when you go into that area, you will have an idea of, okay, we want to maul. If we don't want to maul, this is our special play. So it's almost, you've just got to stick to the plan and back it because that's that's what you've executed all week during training. That's what you've probably visualized before the game. And if you go away from that and you start making stuff up, that to me would show that you're under a lot of pressure um, and, and probably haven't had those conversations during the week to know what they're going to. It should be pretty seamless when you go um, down that end, but they just they just didn't execute um, when they when they needed to most, and probably cost them the game because they had a lot of ball in that second half, and and I know the score blew out towards the end, but it was a lot closer than than that score reads if you watch the whole 80 minutes. Before we move on from you, um, the shrine of Malcolm Marks is just over here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. um, 79th minute, the starting hooker scores oh, a try. I've said it, and I'll say it. I'll say it again. The guy is an 80 minute player. <laughs> I'm sorry to the bench, but the man is an 80 minute. The longer you leave him out there, the more test matches you will win. Yeah. He is an absolute freak. Like in every facet, it's just not even, yeah. oh, yeah, there's not enough you can't. Like his actions do the talking. Like I don't even need to talk to it. Just watch the game. It's just, he's a special, special talent. Uh, do you go to the Church of Marks as well, Will? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I, I do. I'm a believer. Yeah. Uh, he's, the one thing I love, the one, the, the one thing I love about his game is he's got an incredible, incredible work ethic. Like yeah. his work rate on the field. I've, I've, having played him a couple of times in test matches, we were doing a review one time of a uh, try scoring opportunity out against the Springboks, and uh, we'd made a break, good play. We were about, to, you know, about to score after having like a, a long passage of play and a long run. And the guy who made the covering tackle was Malcolm Marks. He'd run about 40 meters. Yeah. And I just couldn't, I didn't understand it. I remember looking at like whoever our hooker was at the time saying, how come you can't do that? <laughs> <laughs> he's superhuman, mate. He's superhuman, I tell you. Oh, he's something else. Absolute specimen of a, of a, of a beast, of a player. And just more so, just, you know, he's got the whole full, he's got the full package, Joe. You know? I know why you sell, sell it. You know? I, know, I know why you like him a lot, mate. So mate, I'm a big advocate. We'll stay there. We'll and keep people, him on there. We'll stay here, mate. But people so. think it's easy just to hook onto the back of a mall. Like, it's actually <laughs> harder than it looks. Like, and he's one of the best at it. Like, you, you, you've got people wanting to grab your jersey and stuff, and he just, he just bosses it at the back and just scores try after try. Come on, He's world oh, class, that, mate. mate. Yeah. Oh, come on, mate. It's You've stolen fun. about 300 <laughs> off me in your career. Oh, I'm, I'm going over the line and you're still trying to call it because you got some pre-planned play. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I think one of our last seasons together, Bryn, at um, Harbour, we were doing a lot of malls and, you know, like I always just trust the halfback. If he calls for it, you, you just put it back there and you give it to him. And I remember Tom Coventry pulled Bryn and I aside and just said, just don't give it to him. You just go, I'm like, well, I can't see anything, mate. Like, and he's like, don't give it to him. So from then on, I was just holding under my chest, hoping that we'd get across the line. We didn't. Uh, <laughs> All right. Hey, well, before we let you go, Will, thank you very much for joining us, by the way. Last time you came on the show, um, we tried our best to convince you to come play NPC. Um, can we get you to come over to the Tasman next year and play a bit of footy over here? Mate, I'd tell you, I would love to. I, I, I really enjoy having six months off, but I also do <laughs> playing footy. I almost feel like... My, my daughter actually said to me, she goes, D Daddy, you're so lazy. What do you do? Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm like, because for six months, I'm just training or doing nothing. So uh, it's, it's always been a dream of mine to come over and play in, in New Zealand at some point. And, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully I can get to do that, yeah, before I finish and, and hang them up. The North Shore is a beautiful spot, mate. You look great in a harbour jersey. It's a harbour, mate. Good to have him, mate. Oh, man, Dan Jersey, Hall Jer Dan Hall Jersey number 21. <laughs> Jersey number 21. I just played 20 minutes. Oh, you're straight into the nine, mate. You'll be straight into the nine. I'd see it at counties. Cam Roygaard followed by Will Genia would be an absolute crazy one-two punch. Mate, Roygaard's an 80-minute player. Yeah. You know, with the opportunity to play off the back of Hoskins to Tutu, Don Papa Lee in front of him, that could be a great counties wow. team. Yeah, I'm not buying your pitch. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> 
Yeah, see, Will's in. Will's in. You undersold. Well, thank you very much, Will. I appreciate all your time and all your insight into uh, the Bledisloe Cup on the weekend and all the best for this coming weekend, kind of. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks again for having me. Right, if we can get Will Genia to counties, I'm going to be a very, very happy man. But Cam Roygaard, goodness me, Jipper Bryn was on the call and oh. he was just loving Cam Roygaard on the weekend, even though they lost to Canterbury. Wow. Oh, mate, oh, it, was, it was a clinic. Like, he, he changed the direction of the match a number of times through quick taps, um, you know, composure. A couple of times he made the break and, you know, didn't necessarily need to reach out. He, he did that one phase more and then they scored. Uh, he's second in the comp for offloads. He, he gave a bounce pass offload um, for McRobbie to score. Um, defensively, he's tackling at 97% or something for a halfback. He's made over 50 tackles. He, he, he has this roaming role where um, I should be his agent. He, <laughs> he has this roaming <laughs> role. Uh, he just flies out. Um, he's, he's, he's a physical beast. I heard that he squatted 200 the other day. That's quite impressive for a halfback. Um, there's not much more I can do. The pass was crisp. Gave like a 40 metre cutout pass. Yeah. What else? <laughs> oh, so, well, now all I want to know is how much Bryn squats as a halfback. Yeah, how much, Bryn? I'm certainly not squatting those these days, boys. I think I'd be, I don't even have the squat in my exercise at the moment. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's great. Chip, I, no, he's obviously been through a bit of um, bit of stuff as well. You know, obviously coming back last year had some injuries, and I guess it just shows his kind of mental fortitude that he's had to be able to come back and really, I guess, be a, a focal point in that county's team because. Um, you know, as a young player, and obviously he's been out of the Hurricanes, and so hopefully this is just a stepping stone to be able to see more consistency and play more games and like that. Because uh, great to be able to see another halfback. But hey, mate, good on you for giving a halfback a pat on the back, mate. Yeah, good mate. On you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I just appreciate the the, the work. Uh, he just looks like such a professional too. Like he's so organised. Um, you know that he's nailed his prep during the week because he just pulls trigger. He doesn't hesitate. You know, like Will was saying about um, Noel Olusio at that international level. Um, and I know it's NPC level, but man, he just pulls trigger and backs his skill set. And even if he gets it wrong, he's so committed to it that it comes mm. off as well. People react to it. Um, so he's having a great season. I don't know where Dwayne Monkley points are at, but he must be in the top five, surely. Yeah, yeah, we'll take that. Who are you liking at the moment? Did you have a, a player of the round, Bryn? Yeah, I actually had um, I had Sean Stevenson um, oh, for yeah. his 50th match. And I, I actually wanted to have the, um, the Harbour back three because it, they're, they're outstanding, the three of those at the moment. It's great to have Tavita Lee back and even Mark Talia, who may, who's just, he'd have to be close to the All Blacks if there's a few injuries. Like, he just had to think that. Well, he's been uh, called he's in. Be there. He's been called in earlier yeah, in the like, season. He's like, trained geez, with him. He is just taking, taking his game to another level. But I gave it to Sean Stevenson on his 50th match as well. I know there would be a lot of um, emotion in that group to be able to get a result for Sean. But again, I think he's playing tremendously as well. So. I went for Sean Stevenson, but you could easily go for the Harbour back three at the moment. I'd love to see Sean get more minutes at 15 at super level. You know, like, I don't know, mm. you watch that Maldives game, he was exceptional um, in Hamilton, and that form's just continued on for North Harbour. He, he was excellent on the weekend, but he's been excellent every week. I agree, Mark Talao, no one works harder on a field than Mark Talao. Like, he just, mm. he is so busy, um, and Tavita Lee's just a, a freak. Mm. <laughs> it's like he's got like a millimetre to run down that sideline and he still swats off four or five people it's, they're, they're a big reason why Harbour are still in with a, with a playoff snuff Look, Waikato, they've got their chance this week to take on Wellington for the Shield And they'll be smarting a little bit um, you know, losing to Otago they probably wouldn't, weren't expecting that you know, but it was at the end of a storm week so, and they did rotate their squad but there was obviously a little bit of fatigue there um, but, I mean, nothing motivates you more, does it, Bryn, than a shield week, uh, especially when you're challenging. Yeah. You won't feel a niggle. You won't feel anything. You'll spring out of bed on Monday and just be like a kid waiting for Christmas till Saturday. Mm, mm. It should be the same, I would have thought, for TJ Perinata. Man, it was good to see him win the Ranfley Shield, you know, a guy who's probably not been around in domestic rugby because he's been in all-black duty, to have a crack at that and pick it up. Same with Julian Sabir. Yeah. You know, they, they've done yeah. everything in the game and, and now they've done, the, you know, they've, they've got the full house, so to speak. Um, and no, those two blokes just compete and like, they've, they've played a lot of footy, but no game is taken for granted. They, they are into everything and, and, and massive part of why a guy like Aidan Morgan's just developing so well, having the experience of TJ on his inside. Mm. Um, I, I think he's a real talent and someone that can probably sort of um, 
secure that Hurricanes 10 for a number of years if he keeps tracking in the, the direction he's going at the moment. He's, he's had a, a, a mighty few weeks and uh, now he's a, a Shield winner as well. Another big game on this weekend and that's the Blackburns um, game up against Japan. It's a massive occasion for them, one last game to get everything right before the World Cup um, at Eden Park with a very big crowd. Uh, what do you think is the most important thing for them this week? I always think when you're going into games like this is, is forget about the score. It's you, you want to go to your key stats and your key measures and if they can you know, operate efficiently at um, set piece, not just win it, have that top quality ball. And by top quality ball, that's the line-outs over all the scrums over once it's in the first five's hands. Um, nothing, nothing before. I think the other key one is discipline. Have a low penalty count, um, be really clean. Um, be really efficient in terms of your tackle percentage, um, but also in that is, is your tackle dominance. Because you, you, sometimes you can tackle at 95% but still have 40 points put on you because you're passive in that 22. So getting that um, you know, defence spot on and, and getting confidence going in when they know they're going to come up against some Northern Hemisphere sides that are, that, that are big and physical. Um, and, and then lastly, I suppose, is just that, that skill execution. We saw it in Christchurch. It was ruthless. Uh, it was clinical. It wasn't anything um, outrageously, um, you know, special plays or anything. It was just players playing on instinct, reacting to their mate inside them, um, and, and it brought the best out of players like Kendra Coxedge, having players like the um, you know, reacting off her and scoring that try. So those sorts of things, you know, and, and limiting those turnovers... Um, will be the key areas I'd be looking at um, you know, for them to you know, boost their morale, so to speak, going into the, the World Cup. Bryn, how hard is it to prepare for a mismatch? Because on paper, this is a mismatch. Oh, well, it depends how you look at it, really. I think if you think of outcome and thinking we're going to put a cricket score on these, on these girls or, or the team, um, that's when you tend to make yourself um, you know, get in a little bit of trouble. Because I think you know, Will talked about it a lot, having that process mindset around just nail your role time and time and time again and not thinking about the outcome of like, scoring tries and how much you will win by. So I think if you live by that mantra of just being able to stay on task and focus on focus and being able to keep doing that consistently, then things work out. But I think an area that I'd love to see them um, can continue to keep improving on is that breakdown area. Just continue to keep being um, ruthless and efficient in that breakdown because obviously you know, the Japanese girls will probably be a little bit smaller, but I think you know the, the height entry and getting low and being able to get quick ball for Kendra and them, that'll be another one that they'll want to probably um, go really well at. I think Jip brought up around their set piece and being able to win that is scrum, scrum and line out, which, was, um, which we struggled against in the Northern Hemisphere teams and probably won't get that challenge um, this, this week. But um, for me, for them to win the World Cup, their breakdown is going to have to be massive. And so the continuation of getting quick ball for the likes of Cox Edge and being able to use those outside backs um, of, um, of the Black Ferns will be really important going through the World Cup. Okay, so I'm going to ask the question, who's going to win the rugby championship? New Zealand. You have to say New Zealand in the box seat at yeah. the moment. They've got the points differential, um, but they've, like, I think that bonus point could be key. Like It's not just mm. a win and they win. Uh, getting the bonus point mm. will secure it, I believe. If, if Argentina was oh. as consistent as you guys are on your picks, they'd be nailing this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, Ross, weren't you back in Australia? Yeah. I was back in Australia, but that all changed last week, didn't it? <laughs> I was. Do you remember that, mate? You were back in Australia. That's why they call it gambling. There's no sure thing. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't looking too bad with, you know, one minute left on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> it was looking pretty good. Yeah, I think you were. A bleeder's low cup and a... Uh, you are right in the mixer. Yeah, nah, and then it was suddenly out, um, you know. And still, I, I've got no anger towards Raynal. No. Despite all of that, no. <laughs> I enjoyed the call. Enjoyed the, re the end of the game. It was good fun. Okay, lads, well, enjoy the footy this weekend. You too. Thank you very much again. And we'll catch you all again next week on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Matewa.